Welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. We are continuing to read W.E.B. Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk. Some people pronounce this W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, I'm going to keep going with W.E.B. Du Bois, because even if I try to start doing W.E.B. Du Bois, my habit will get me back to doing Du Bois. I've heard it pronounced both ways. All right, we are on Chapter 5. This chapter is entitled, Of the Wings of Atlanta. Even though Atlanta looks like it's spelled a little differently. On this one, it's Atalanta. <clears throat> oh, black boy of Atlanta, but half was spoken. The slave chains and the masters alike are broken. The one curse of the races held both in tether. They are rising, all are rising, the black and white together. Whittier. South of the north, yet north of the south, lies the city of a hundred hills, peering out from the shadows of the past into the promise of the future. I have seen her in the morning when the first flush of day had half roused her. She lay gray and still on the crimson soil of Georgia. Then the blue smoke began to curl from her chimneys. The tinkle of bell and scream of whistle broke the silence. The rattle and roar of busy life slowly gathered and swelled until the seething world of the city seemed a strange thing in a sleepy land. Once, they say, even Atlanta slept dull and drowsy at the foothills of the Algonies until the iron baptism of war awakened her with its sullen waters, aroused and maddened her, and left her listening to the sea. And the sea cried to the hills, and the hills answered the sea, till the city rose like a widow and cast away her weeds and toiled for her daily bread. Toiled steadily, toiled cunningly, perhaps with some bitterness, with a touch of reclaim, and yet with real earnestness and real sweat. It is a hard thing to live haunted by the ghost of an untrue dream, to see the wide vision of empire fade into real ashes and dirt, to feel the pang of the conquered, and yet know that with all the bad that fell on one black day, something was vanquished that deserved to live, something killed that injustice had not dared to die. To know that with the right that triumphed, triumphed something of wrong, something sordid and mean, something less than the broadest and best. All this is bitter hard, and many a man and city and people have found in it excuse for sulking and brooding and listless waiting. Such are not men of the sturdier make. They of Atlanta turned res resolutely toward the future, and that future held aloft vistas of purple and gold. Atlanta, queen of the cotton kingdom. Atlanta, gateway to the land of the sun. Atlanta, the new Lachis, spinner of web and woof for the world. So the city crowned her hundred hills with factories and stored her shops with cunning handiwork and stretched long iron ways to greet the busy Mercury in his coming. And the nation talked of her striving. Perhaps Atlanta was not christened for the winged maiden of dull Boatia. You know the tale how swervely Atlanta, tall and wild, would marry only him who outraced her, and how the wily Hippomenes laid three apples of gold in the way. She fled like a shadow, paused, startled over the first apple, but even as he stretched his hand, fled again, hovered over the second, then, slipping from his hot grasp, flew over river, vale, and hill. But as she lingered over the third, his arms fell round her, and looking on each other, the blazing passion of their love profaned the sanctuary of love, and they were cursed. If Atlanta be not named for Atalanta, she ought to have been. Atalanta is not the first or the last maiden whom greed of gold has led to defile the temple of love. And not maids alone, but men in the race of life, sink from the high and generous ideals of youth to the gambler's code of the boars. And in all our nation's striving is not the gospel of work befouled by the gospel of pay? So common is that one half think it normal. So unquestioned that we almost fear to question if the end of racing is not gold, if the aim of man is not rightly to be rich. And if this is the fault of America, how dire a danger lies before a new land and a new city, lest Atlanta, stooping for mere gold, shall find that gold accursed. It was no maiden's idol when, excuse me, it was no maiden's idle whim that started this hard racing. 
A fearful wilderness lay about the feet of that city after the war. Feudalism, poverty, the rise of the third estate, serfdom, the rebirth of law and order, and above and between all, the veil of race. How heavy a journey for weary feet. What wings must Atlanta have to flit over all this hollow and hill? Through sour wood and sullen water, and by the red waste of sun baked clay. How fleet must Atlanta be if she will not be tempted by gold to profane the sanctuary? The sanctuary of our fathers has, to be sure, few gods. Some sneer, quote, all too few, end quote. There is the thrifty Mercury of New England, Pluto of the North, and Ceres of the West. And there, too, is the half forgotten Apollo of the South, under whose ages the maiden ran, and as she ran, forgot him, even as there in Boatia, Venus was forgot. She forgot the old ideal of the Southern gentleman, that new world heir of the grace and courtliness of, patri of patrician, knight, and noble. Forgot his honor with his foibles, his kindliness with his carelessness, and stooped to apples of gold, to men busier and sharper, thriftier and more unscrupulous. Golden apples are beautiful. I remember the lawless days of boyhood, when orchids and crimson and gold tempted me over fence and field. And, too, the merchant who was dethroned the planter is no despicable parvenu. Work and wealth are the mighty levers to lift this old new land. Thrift and toil saving are the highways to new, ho to new hopes and new possibilities. And yet the warning is needed lest the wily hippomines tempt Atlanta to thinking that golden apples are the goal of racing and no more incidents, by the way, and not mere incidents, by the way. Excuse me. Atlanta must not lead the South to dream of material prosperity as the touchstone of all success. Already the fatal might of this idea is beginning to spread. It is replacing the finer type of Southerner with vulgar money getters. It is burying the sweeter beauties of Southern life beneath pretense and obstination. For every social ill, the panacea of wealth has been, has been urged. Wealth to overthrow the remains of the slave feudalism. Wealth to raise the, quote, cracker, end quote, third estate. Wealth to employ the black serfs and the prospect of wealth to keep them working. Wealth as the end and aim of politics and as the legal tender for law and order. And finally, instead of truth, beauty and goodness, wealth as the ideal of the public school. Okay, let's take a moment to reflect here. And this is, so he's, throughout this chapter, W.E.B. Du Bois is mixing Greek mythology. I believe that's Greek mythology. Maybe Roman mythology. Greek and Roman mythology are sort of convoluted. I think once Rome conquered Greece, they like tried to amalgamate their deities into one. And so throughout this text, he's using mythology to draw a parallel to the values that exist in American society. And he's taking the time to emphasize the fact that wealth has become the number one value, that making money has become the number one value, that uh, it, that things that should not be things that that the the idea of life has been instead of the pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of money, and he points out the dangers that exist in there, and he talks about how the aim of politics is about wealth, how the aim of law and order is about wealth, the aim of public school is about wealth, the aim of all of these different things that were emerging were all about wealth. And that is one of the hindrances that exists within capitalism. And that is why we cannot simply just, that there's been a lot of rhetoric about how the way to defeat the racist structures and racist institutions that are in place currently in America is about trying to get black people more jobs or getting black people more economically advanced or, or financially advanced and black people making more money. And the truth of the matter is, is that racism and capitalism are intertwined with each other and trying to beat racism with capitalism is as ludicrous as trying to beat capitalism with racism. Uh, there are two 
two sides of the same coin. And And I think that it's important to hear him highlighting these things because of the fact that a lot of times we, and then currently a lot of the people who are considered to be quote unquote black leaders are the black people with the most amount of money or black people with the most amount of wealth or black people with a substantial amount of money. And it's not necessarily black people who have, who are, who are philosophical or black people who are uh, activists or black people who are forward thinking or trying to get us to a better place as the masses of black people. There are a lot of black people who have focused on their individual wealth and their individual success. And a lot of times that is used against the masses of black people. They don't use the one or two or three or four black people who accumulate wealth to, to destroy racist thoughts, thoughts or racist concepts. They use it to, to, to uh, embolden, not embolden is not the right word I'm looking for, but they use them to uh, sort of, we'll just use embolden for, no, embolden is not the right word. Uh, They use it as sort of a crutch. They say, well, this is the exception, or why can't you, or you're not like the other black people, or why can't you be like this person? Or they point to, well, this person did this, and they were black, so you should be able to do these same things. And so individualism, is oftentimes the enemy of collectivism and it's not a an ally to collectivism and so individual black people accumulating wealth is not a weapon to be used against racism a lot of times it will be a tool that is used to perpetuate racism and We've, we've spoken about here how police terrorism and mass incarceration have direct ties to money, that when you get arrested, you got to pay money to get out of jail. When you get found convicted, you pay court fines. Or uh, when people get tickets, they pay fines. And a lot of, one of the things you hear about public school, or not even just public schools, because this was a time where private schools wasn't anywhere near the same relevance as they are now. But these schools are also used as to be seen as a way for you to go to college or go get a job. There's not necessarily about becoming more knowledgeable or educating yourself or, or learn, learning about truth and the importance of truth. Uh, and then also in here, we see the importance of the city of Atlanta in black history and in black culture in American history and American culture. And I think all of those things are what stands out from this first section that we've read. Okay. Had to take a slight break there. Let's pick up where we left off. Not only is this true in the world, which Atlanta typifies, but it's threatening to be true of a world beneath and beyond that world, the black world beyond the veil. Today, it makes little difference to Atlanta, to the South, what the Negro thinks, dreams, or wills. In the sole life of the land, he is today, and naturally will long remain, unthought of, half forgotten. And yet when he does come to think and will and do for himself, and let no man dream that day will never come, then the part he plays will not be one of sudden learning, but words and thoughts he has been taught to lisp in his race childhood. Today, the ferment of his striving towards self-realization is to, to the strife of the white world like a wheel within a wheel. Beyond the veil are smaller, but light problems of ideals, leaders, and the lead, of serfdom, of poverty, of order and subordination and, through all, the veil of race. Few know of these problems, few who know notice them, and yet there they are, a waiting student, artist, and seer, a field for somebody penetrated, excuse me, a field for somebody to discover, a field for somebody sometime to discover, excuse me. Hither has the temptation of hippomenes penetrated. Already in this smaller world, which now indirectly and, and non-directly must influence the larger for good or ill, the habit is forming of interpreting the world in dollars. The old leaders of Negro opinion and the little groups where there is a Negro social consciousness are being replaced by new. Neither the black preacher nor the black teacher leads us as he did two decades ago. Until their places are pushing the farmers and gardeners, 
the well-paid porters and artisans, the businessmen, all those with property and money. And with all this change, so curiously parallel to that of the other world, goes to the same inevitable change in ideals. The South laments today the slow, steady disappearance of a certain type of Negro, the faithful, courteous slave of other days, with his incorruptible honesty and dignified humility. He is passing away just as surely as the old type of Southern gentleman is passing, and from not dissimilar causes. The sudden transformation of a fair, far-off ideal of freedom into the land, into the hard reality of breadwinning and the consequent defecation of bread. In the black world, the preacher and teacher embodied once the ideals of this people, the strife for another and a juster world, the vague dream of righteousness, the mystery of knowing. But today the danger is that these ideals with their simple beauty and weird inspiration will suddenly sink to a question of cash and a lust for gold. Here stands this young black Atalanta, guarding herself for the race that must be run. And if her eyes be still toward the hills and sky as in the days of old, then we may look for noble running. But what if some ruthless or wily or even thoughtless hippomines lay golden apples before her? What if the Negro people be wooed from a strife for righteousness, from a love of knowing, to regard dollars as the be-all and end-all of life? What if to the mammon, mammonism, mammonism, excuse me, what if to the mammonism of America be added the rising mammonism of the reborn South and the mammonism, mammonism, of the South be reinforced by the budding mammonism of its half-awakened black millions. Whither, then, is the new world quest of goodness and beauty and truth going glimmering? Must this, and that fair flower of freedom which, despite the jeers of latter-day striplings sprung from our fathers' blood, must that too degenerate into a dusty quest of gold, into lawless lust with hippomines? And... Again, he continues to intertwine uh, stories of Greek mythology. I, I, it's been a while since I read some of those stories. I got to touch up on it. One of the things that excuse me, sorry about that. One of the things that tends to happen as you go back and read different pieces of literature is that people use when people draw metaphors and analogies, they do things that were relevant to the time period. And so I think that even just in reading a book like The Souls of Black Folk, it teaches you about so many different uh, different things based on that time period and refreshes you on so many different things based on that time period. And so, again, he keeps going through and comparing some of the issues uh, that are taking place in Atlanta to the story of Atalanta and a few of those times I, I didn't differentiate those in my pronunciation the right way and speaking about the black community as they become more assimilated and strive to become more assimilated and part of uh, the mainstream American culture taking on the faults that were beginning to emerge and taking place in mainstream American culture. And one of the ones he specifically was pointing out was the fault of capitalism, the faults of, and he didn't use the word capitalism, but a lot of the things that he was diagnosing or symptoms he was uh, pointing out diagnosing are symptoms are, come from capitalism, greed, uh, money, and talking about how those things were not this of the same value or valued the same way within the black community as they were outside the black community and pointed out specifically how the teacher and the preacher, the importance that they held within the black community and the, the admiration and reverence that they held within the black community and how that was being subverted for the person who could make the most money and the person who could have, uh, the most wealth. And so 
And again, that's something that we pointed out as we've gone through each book. We've talked about how the uh, so many of these aspects of racism, which continue to be perpetuated, are held together by capitalism and ideals of capitalism. And again, this is something that was written at this point, I believe, over, is it over 100 years ago, if not close to 100 years? I'll have to find that out for sure. Okay, let's continue reading. The hundred hills of Atlanta are not all crowned with factories. On one, toward the west, the setting sun throws three buildings in bold relief against the sky. The beauty of the group lies in its simple unity, a broad lawn of green rising from the red street with mingled roses and peaches. North and south, two plain and stately halls, and in the midst, half hidden in ivy, a larger building, boldly graceful, sparingly decorated, and with one low spire. It is a restful group. One never looks for more. It is all here, all intelligible. There I live, and there I hear from day to day the low hum of restful life. In winter's twilight, when the, sun re when the red sun glows, I can see the dark figures pass between the halls to the music of the night bell. In the morning, when the sun is golden, the clang of the day bell brings the hurry and laughter of 300 young hearts from the hall and street. And from the busy city below, children all dark and heavy-haired, to join their clear young voices in the music of the morning sacrifice. In a half dozen classrooms they gather then, here to follow the love song of Ditto, here to listen to the tale of Troy Divine, there to wander among the stars, there to wander among men and nations, and elsewhere other well-worn ways of knowing this queer world. Nothing new, no time-saving devices, simply old-time glorified methods of delving for truth and searching out the hidden beauties of life and learning the good of living. The riddle of existence is the college curriculum that was laid before the pharaohs, that was taught in the groves by Plato, that formed the trivium and quadri quadrivium, and is today laid before the freedmen's sons by Atlanta University. And this course of study will not change. Its methods will grow more deft and effectual, its content richer by toil of scholar and sight of seer. But the true college will ever have one goal, not to earn meat, but to know the end and aim of that life which meat nourishes. The vision of life that rises before these dark eyes has in it nothing mean or selfish. Not at Oxford or at Leipzig, not at Yale or Columbia, is there an air of higher resolve or more unfettered striving. The determination to realize for men, both black and white, the broadest possibilities of life, to seek the better and the best, to spread with their own hands the gospel of sacrifice, all this is the burden of their talk and dream. Here, amid a wide desert of caste and proscription, amid the heart-hurting slights and jars and vagaries of a deep race dislike, lies this green oasis where hot anger cools and the bitterness of disappointment is sweetened by the springs and breezes of a Parnassus. And here men may lie and listen and learn of a future fuller than the past and hear the voice of time. Okay, sorry. Uh, let's keep reading. They made their mistakes, those who planted Fisk and Howard in Atlanta before the smoke of battle had lifted. They made their mistakes, but those mistakes were not the things at which we lately laughed somewhat uproariously. They were right when they sought to found a new educational system upon the university. Wherefore, soothed, shall we ground knowledge save on the broadest and deepest knowledge? Oh man, this is like some feedback in the mic. It's cord. I hate, I hate, I hate when I'm recording the episode. You can hear the cord moving in the back, man. Now I'm trying to move the cord around to get this noise off the background. Hold on. And I got this all on this one take. I don't even want to, I guess I could go back and just cut this off. All right, I'm going to have to start over. Hold on one second. Okay. I think we got this mic thing figured out. Where did I leave off at? Okay. They were right when they sought to found a new educational system upon the university. Where forsooth shall we ground knowledge save on the broadest and deepest knowledge? 
The roots of the tree, rather than the leaves, are the sources of its life. And from the dawn of history, from academics to Cambridge, the culture of the university has been the broad foundation stone on which is built the kindergarten's ABC. But these builders did make a mistake in minimizing the gravity of the problem before them and thinking it a matter of years and decades, and therefore building quickly and laying their foundation carelessly and lowering the standard of knowing until they had scattered haphazard through the South some dozen poorly equipped high schools and miscalled them universities. They forgot, too, just as their successors are forgetting the rule of inequality, that of the million black youth, some were fitted to know and some to dig, that some had the talent and capacity of university men and some the talent and capacity of blacksmiths, and that true training meant neither that all should be college men nor all artisans, but that one should be made a missionary of culture to an untaught people and the other a free worker among serfs. And to seek to make the blacksmith a scholar is almost as silly as the more modern scheme of making the scholar a blacksmith. Almost, but not quite. The function of the university is not simply to teach breadwinning or to furnish teachers for the public schools or to be a center of a polite society. It is, above all, to be the organ of that fine adjustment between real life and the growing knowledge of life an adjustment which forms the secret of civilization. Such an institution the South, excuse me, such an institution the South of today sorely needs. She has religion, earnest, bigoted. Religion that on both sides of the veil often omits the sixth, seventh, and eighth commandments, but substitutes a dozen supplementary ones. She has, as Atlanta shows, growing thrift and love of toil but she lacks that broad knowledge of what the world knows and knew of human living and doing, which she may apply to the thousand problems of real life today confronting her. The need of the South is knowledge and culture, not in dainty limited quantity as before the war, but in broad, busy abundance in the world of work. And until she has this, not all the apples of her besides, be thy golden and bejeweled, can save her from the curse of the Boatian lovers. Man. I have to look up all these Greek stories, Greek mythology stories again that he put in here. The wings of Atlanta are the coming universities of the South. They alone can bear the maiden past, the temptation of golden fruit. They will not guide her flying feet away from the cotton and gold. For, ah, thoughtful hippomines, do not the apples lie in the very way of life? But they will guide her over and beyond them and leave her kneeling in the sanctuary of truth and freedom and broad humanity. Virgin and undefiled. Sadly did the old South air in human education, despising the education of the masses and niggardly in the support of colleges. Her ancient university foundations dwindled and withered under the foul breath of slavery. And even since the war, they have fought a failing fight for life in the tainted air of social unrest and commercial selfishness, stunned by the death of criticism and starving for lack of broadly cultured men. And if this is the white South's need and danger, how much heavier the danger and the need of the free men's sons. How pressing here the need of broad ideals and true culture, the conservation of soul from sordid aims and petty passions. Let us build the Southern University, William and Mary, Trinity, Georgia, Texas, Tulane, Vanderbilt, and the others, fit to live. Let us build, too, the Negro universities, Fisk, whose foundation was ever broad, Howard at the heart of the nation, Atlanta, at Atlanta, whose ideal of scholarship has been held above the temptation of numbers. Why not here, and perhaps elsewhere, plant deeply and for all time centers of learning and living, colleges that yearly would send into the life of the South a few white men and a few black men of broad culture, Catholic tolerance and trained ability, joining their hands to other hands and giving to this squabble of joining and giving to this squabble of the races a decent and dignified peace. Patience, humility, manners, and taste, common schools and kindergartens, industrial and technical schools, literature and tolerance, all these spring from knowledge and culture, the children of the university. So must men and nations build, not otherwise, not upside down. Teach workers to work, 
why I say, when applied to German boys and American girls. Wiser when said of Negro boys, for they have less knowledge of working and none to teach them. Teach thinkers to think, a needed knowledge in a day of loose and careless logic. And they whose law and they whose lot is gravest must have the careful training to think aright. If these things are so, how foolish it is to ask what is the best education for one or seven or sixty million souls. Shall we teach them trades or train them in liberal arts? Neither in both. Teach the workers to work and the thinkers to think. Make carpenters of carpenters and philosophers of philosophers and, fop, and fops of fools. Nor can we pause here. We are training not isolated men, but a living group of men. Nay, a group within a group. And the final product of our training must be neither a psychologist nor a brick mason, but a man. And to make men, we must have ideals, broad, pure, and inspiring ends of living. Not sordid money getting, not apples of gold. The worker must work for the glory of his handiwork, not simply for pay. The thinker must think for truth, not for fame. And all this is gained only by human strife and longing, by ceaseless training and education, by founding right on righteousness and truth on the unhampered search for truth, by founding the common school on the university and the industrial school on the common school, and weaving thus a system, not a distortion, and bringing a birth, not an abortion. When night falls on the city of a hundred hills, a wind gathers itself from the seas and comes murmuring westward. And at its bidding, the smoke of the drowsy factory sweeps down upon the mighty city and covers it like a pall, while yonder at the university the stars twinkle above Stone Hall. And they say that yon gray mist is the tunic of Atlanta pausing over her golden apples. Fly, my maiden, fly, for yonder comes Hippomenes. That is the end of chapter five. Okay, so upon reflection, I think what stands out to me is the the manner in which he W. E. B. Du Bois writes, or at least that these passages within this book are written in. I'm starting to be able to see the see understand his ideology and his belief system more. I'm starting to be able to understand sort of where he was fitting in at in history, where he was coming in at like the time, what the times felt like. Uh, and I've been uh, in, in between reading this, I've been watching things about W.E.B. Du Bois and I listened to some, uh, some audio recordings of his and the, the, the direct nature in being able to not only diagnose the problem, but also recommend a treatment for the problem is what is very specific to me about what I'm reading from him. And the, the, his, the foreshadowing that he did of not just issues for black people, but issues for the country as a whole, the way he spoke about how issues for the country as a whole had direct correlation to issues of black people and the time period in which he was saying these things and having these thoughts it's all it always is something that stands out to me to think about what it must feel like or 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 what the experience must be like as a black person in this time period to be able to understand and articulate these type of concepts and these type of thoughts and be subjugated and marginalized at the level in which he was subjugated and marginalized. Like the, this man would every day deal with white people who he was far more intelligent than far more intellectual than who would belittle him because he was black or who made him uh, who, or he had to be treated like a second class citizen to because he was black. And so those are some of the things that stand out when you just think about how well written this is to think about what type of experience it must be that double consciousness that he speaks about where in one sense, he's one of the most educated men in the world. Uh, one of the most, I don't know if educated is the right term, but uh, I think educate, he went to multiple colleges. And, 
but you understand what I'm saying that he is this man of such of intellectual intelligent stature, but at the same time he has to ride in the black car or the black ride in the black part of a car to get home or he has to get his food from the back of a restaurant or he has to use a certain water fountains he has to live only in certain neighborhoods and so he his mind has no uh really limitations on it but his life is uh constricted by limitations and then the importance the, the way he spoke about the importance of truth and the importance of teaching and the importance of these things not being done for fame or these things not being done for riches. And I think that that's something that is very lost on our society today because of the fact that capitalism has uh, grown to the proportions that it has grown to is that oftentimes if whatever it is that you're, whatever, if your journey, if you're in the midst of your journey, if that journey is not something that is bringing in finances and making you uh, in the process of making you richer or more successful, it's looked at as if that is a waste of time or it's looked at as if uh, it's something that is, or if it's not making you famous, you know, the, the catchphrase or the term now is, you know, the concept of clout. If those things aren't coming from it, then it's not something that's useful. And I think that the importance that he puts on enriching the man and creating the man, he talks about how they weren't, just simply creating workers or simply creating uh, uh, thinkers that they were uh, in truth, in truth, creating men. And so th that, that stands out to me as well. And the, the way he used Atlanta as sort of the backdrop, the importance that he put on the universities and how he spoke about how the possibilities of universities falling prey to some of these concepts that he's mentioning as well. So those are all some of my takeaways from this. We're over our 30 minute mark. So we're going to end this episode here and we will be back tomorrow to begin reading chapter six of the souls of black folk.